Tell us about William Killian. What, what kind of work did you do before becoming president of Blue Ridge Community College? I was working at another institution in the community college system, Catawba Valley Tech at Hickory. Mm -hmm. I was a director of instruction there. And prior to that, I had done teaching in the public school system. I'm a former BOAG teacher. My major at NC State was in vocational or agricultural education. And I taught agriculture and then when the community college system was founded, I took a position at Catawba Valley Tech as a ag tech coordinator. And uh, was then evening director and uh, director of instruction when I came here. In the meantime, while I was at Catawba Valley, I went back to NC State and got a doctor's degree in education. But I came here from Hickory, North Carolina. Brought your family to Hendersonville, North Carolina, and and uh, how how did Blue Ridge Community College come about? I know there was a lot of things that probably happened before you before you came. Obviously, some community colleges had already been founded. Yes, quite a few had already been founded, but the system was relatively new. Uh, been going some six seven years, but. Uh, in April of the year that I was employed, 1969, uh, there was legislation in the North Carolina uh, legislature authorizing the establishment of a uh, technical institute at Hendersonville. And, uh, and at the same time, or just prior to the legislation, uh, the county, the local community here had a bond issue concerned schools, the hospital, and a, a small bond issue authorizing uh, funding for the Technical Institute if it was approved by the legislature. Mm -hmm. So that's a little background on, prior to my coming here. So they began to, to look for a president and uh Tell us, do you remember that first day on the job? What, what did that look like? What, what did you do that day? Who did you meet? I remember several days just prior to that. Uh, we had a very humble beginning. Uh, I had an office in the courthouse, third floor. It was the office that had been previously occupied by the uh, superintendent of schools. And uh, just the week prior to that, uh, uh, Bill McKay, who was chairman of the uh, selection committee, after I'd been selected, he led me up to the third floor to, of the courthouse and opened the door, four bare walls, not a thing in there. And he said, this is it. You're on your own from now on. So the next week of uh, December the 1st, uh, I reported to the courthouse and uh, I had learned that Sinclair Office Supply, which handled uh, office furniture and office supplies, diagonally across the street from the courthouse, might loan me a desk. <laughs> so Not I walked, buy one, but loan one, right? <laughs> yeah, we didn't own a thing, didn't have a telephone or anything. So I walked over and talked to Mr. Sinclair and he said yes. we." on the desk, so the fellow that worked for him brought it over, it was a big desk, and I helped uh, assisted the guy who was working for Sinclair to move that desk up to the third floor. So I, I started at the ground floor. You've moved furniture. <laughs> and moved furniture. And then we got a telephone, and uh, later, I think around in the latter part of December, I employed a secretary and sort of got organized. Mm -hmm. How much time passed from maybe these very first days that you've just described till Church Street? How, mu how much time passed until the, what we call the uh, Church Street years? Well, we started on Church Street that uh, in 1970. I was employed December the 1st of, for 69, so I had a, just one, one month in 69. And then we started on Church Street 
in September of 70. So from January the 1st of uh, 1970 till September, we used for preparation, hired a small staff, and uh, was authorized to start certain courses and all. And uh, finding a place to start was a, quite a, an experience. Uh, we didn't own any building. We didn't have any space at all. And I envisioned maybe being able to start in an abandoned school building or something like that, but there wasn't anything like that available. Also, uh, commercial buildings were not available. Uh, Henderson County or Hendersonville had the high, un high employment so the industries here that were operating, like GE and Federal Paper Board, had rented all the vacant space around town. I Bus couldn't. Business was booming, sounded like. I couldn't find a thing in which to start the semblance of a school. So one day, and I think in February of 1970, I walked out the back of the courthouse, and just in back of the courthouse was an old motor company building formerly called Gross's Corner. And some guys were loading carpet onto a truck. So I spoke to them and I said, what's happening here? And one of them said, uh, we're moving out. And uh, so that interested me. I, I said, well, you know who owned the building? He said, yes, sir. Uh, he told me the lady's name owned the building. So I quickly called her and asked her if she had rent it. And she said, yes. She, she would rent it. So we worked out the details. Of, she owned the building, and uh, but it had been occupied by several auto dealerships. Yeah. So it was an automotive building. Front of it had the showroom, and the back of it had uh, space for repair shop mm -hmm. and so forth. Mm -hmm. What were some of the first programs that you offered at Church Street? Uh, we were authorized to start four, five programs. Uh, and all of them in the vocational area, or what would be termed the vocational area, uh, welding, automotive uh, mechanics or automotive repair, uh, secretarial science, or we call it secretarial science, drafting, mm -hmm. and uh, electrical installation and maintenance, I think was our fifth pro. Mm -hmm. So very very simple vocational programs. We had done a survey, a community survey, with the staff who had been able to employ, and those were the ones that showed up on the survey as being needed, and uh, state we apply, applied to this. It was then the State Board of Education we applied to them, and they approved those to start. So we started with five programs. Some of those we still have. <laughs> Um, as I was looking back over some of the history, why the name change in 1970, do you think, from Henderson County Technical Institute to Blue Ridge Technical Institute? Well, that's interesting. Uh, we were, although a student living anywhere can attend any college you want to, sure. uh, we were given responsibility for Transylvania County, uh, Brevard. And we found that the... Uh, with all due respect to the Transylvania people, they were a little uh, provincial. And uh, they, the idea of attending a school named Henderson County didn't appeal to too much to the Transylvania people. So we hit on the idea of a, of a regional name. And sure. the uh, Blue Ridge Mountains stretch through here. And so we, we agreed sometime in uh, early 1970 to call it Henderson County, I mean Blue Ridge Technical Institute. And uh, it was more or less to, well it, it was a good good move to take a regional name, but it was also to avoid the somewhat provincialism of mm -hmm. Transylvania County. Gave you room to expand for sure. Where do the patents come into the story? Had you heard, had the patents already approached the college at this point? Uh, Mrs. Patton, who was the local historian, her husband Preston had 
previously passed on, but she had, uh, she was living, I talked with her a number of times, she had let the Board of Education know that if an institution of this type was established here, uh, the remains of the patent land that she had would, would go for toward establishing that. She had some 150 acres uh, near, well, on, out here where the present campus is. But uh, she also had bits and pieces of property elsewhere that we were authorized to sell. And so she was community minded, uh, very much interested in education. And she had just let it be known that if a school like this was established, she'd, she would give the land towards the establishment. She had previously given land in the city for Patton Park and other, other civic endeavors of that type. <clears throat> what a huge impact the Pattons had on the history of our college. Well, it, it, it got us on our way. Uh, we didn't have to authorize funds for buying of land. Uh, it was a good selling point, and Ms. Patton highly respected in the community, uh, so it was, it, it helped uh, get us started. And 43 years later, the building still there, still carries her husband's name. Well, that was one request she had, that she had uh, two requests. One was that at least one building, she didn't care wh which part of our property, her property we used, but one building had to be built on Patton property and one building had to be named after her husband. So the Patton building was named after Preston. Joe Spearman's always been a significant supporter of the college. How did he get involved? Who? Joe Spearman, how did he get involved with the college? Well, Joe was a businessman in the community who was on the county board of education. Of course, the subject of, of a technical institute uh, came up before the County Board of Education. They had four, uh, County Board of Education appointed four members to the Blue Ridge Board. The uh, governor appointed four and the county commissioners. So they had involvement uh, by being represented on the board of the community, of the uh, Technical Institute. And Joe was a member of the, the uh, uh, County Board of Education, he was also very civic-minded and interested in uh, development in the community and what went on. He uh, had a very prominent business here, so that's, that's how he became involved. What would you think were the biggest changes that you saw during your presidency? Well, uh, of course, the biggest change would have been the growth of the institution. Uh, curriculum was uh, the change in technology that was taking place all over the country, computers. Mm -hmm. uh, we were, the computer was in existence when we were uh, started, but not, it was not to the extent that uh, it is today. And uh, I remember we bought the first electronic calculators. Salesmen came by one day and we bought some of those. I think the first ones were 150 or 60 dollars. Now you can, little handheld ones, well, you can get for several dollars that do all that that did. Yes, yes. So the changing, changing technology and uh, the country as a whole, uh, this was Vietnam Mm -hmm. era time. The I mean, Vietnam War was going on at that time and anyone who lived from that period to the day know that un the country itself underwent tremendous changes in its behavior, way of thinking and everything. But uh, that, that would be the, and the changes throughout the country of course affected schools or anybody mm -hmm. training people for work. <clears throat> a lot of veterans appeared on the 
yes, community we college had, campus. Yeah, we had quite a few veterans. Uh, and I would guess that in the, the very first student body, we probably had 25% uh, were veterans. Mm -hmm. You kind of started talking about it, but do you remember the first computer? What uh, yes, uh, it was a, being a state operated system, it was authorized from Raleigh, the type of computer we had. And uh, we had probably one or two rooms devoted to it. Mm -hmm. uh, big contraption. <laughs> but they were probably huge. Huge and uh, temperature wise, it was hot or wherever, it gave off a lot of heat. But it was hooked into the uh, uh, the state system, and uh, that's about all. I I'm, I didn't operate it or try to. Sure. And but we taught uh, computer classes and courses, and uh, gradually became acclimated to the computer world. Mm -hmm. In the book that David Holcomb wrote about the first thirty years of the college. He entitled the chapter talking about the move to this campus, the chapter that he describes that move, he entitled that the People's College. No, let me back up. He entitled that the People's School. What do you think about that? Well, it was. Mm -hmm. That's a, an accurate description. And uh, the. Uh, Henderson County, uh, this area, very proud people here. They're proud of their community and proud of their work ethic and all. And they 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 viewed it as their school. And I, uh, as head of the school, very much tried to promote that idea mm -hmm. that this is your school, and uh, we're going to train people for the jobs that are here in your community. So. Uh, that's an accurate, accurate description of it, and I think the people felt that way. You and I were chatting earlier. Um, when I was hired at the college, you, you were the president, and, and I appreciate that. Um, Dr. Killian, my perception is that a lot of the staff and faculty that you hired have made Blue Ridge Community College their life's work. They stay 30 and 35 years. Why do you think that is? Uh, it was a big advantage in employing people, especially the first staff, that, that Henderson County was a good place to live. It was already a retirement community of some sort. People came here from uh, all parts of the country, mm -hmm. particularly the north, Midwest, Northeast, to live. And so it had a reputation of being a very uh, nice place to live. And that entered into uh, employing people. Uh, many of them had had some relationship or some uh, connection to uh, the county, but uh, it was a, good, a do delightful, very good place to live. And uh, so that made it easier in employing people. And uh, many, of course, could have moved on to other jobs. Uh, other community colleges probably had supplements that would have attracted them to move on, but uh, they wanted to live here. Mm -hmm. And so where you live and wh where you work is a very important aspect of whether you stay with the job or not. And that's, that's what happened. They liked living here. Mm -hmm. And in addition to living here, it was a very good attraction uh, to employ new people. So it was a good place to live. Sure. Very much so. We, we still um, do this, but people wear many hats. Uh, you may have found yourself recruiting students in the early days and hmm. including um, top level administrative, but how, how were you able to stretch the limited resources? Well, we did that very thing. With the staff that we had, uh, uh, starting early in uh, 70, I talked with the guidance counselors in the, each of the high schools, 
But uh, the school was new, uh, new idea. We didn't have a, a technical institute here. Uh, guidance counselors were responsible for discussing future plans with their students. And uh, I'm sure there was skepticism among uh, them as to re recommending mm -hmm. students. Uh, the most frequent question I got during those early years, are you here to stay? <laughs> are you here to stay? Uh, not from people in education necessarily, but from just general population mm -hmm. because even though the community college system was uh, a going thing here in North Carolina, we didn't have one here. And then a lot of them were not familiar with what community institutions did. So uh, one fellow said to me, I, I really like what you're doing, but are you here to stay? Are you going to be here next year? And of course that entered into uh, plans for their children or whatever. They wanted to send their, or recommend that their child go to a school that was and I, of course, reassured them. It was a state institution. It was succeeding in other parts of the country. And here in North Carolina, there was no doubt about mm -hmm. our staying. But uh, it, that was a factor. Uh, the newness, just the sheer newness of, and you were starting off in a, uh, an old former motor company building. Uh, am I gonna go to <laughs> school there, it, we, we had a very, very humble beginning. <clears throat> We've enjoyed a huge amount of community support over the last 43 years. Who were the champions in the community when you were president? Names that come to my mind are Frank Eubank, Bo you, Thomas. You mean individuals? Yeah, individuals. Who, who were your champions? Who were your, the college's champions back then? Well, they mainly came from the business community because they did see the mission of the Technical Institute as training employees mm -hmm. for their businesses. Uh, Frank Eubank, longtime uh, citizen in the community, real estate, knew, knew the history of the community as well as anyone. Uh, John Gregory, who was our first chairman, was uh, head of Cranston print work. Uh, Chamber of Commerce, very, very supportive. Ray Cantrell, who headed up the, uh, and then the various banks. Uh, Bill McGee at uh, First Union, Dan Gibson at, no, Bill McGee at Northwestern, Dan Gibson at uh, First Union. Uh, again, uh, they, they, they saw the training, the type of thing we were doing, and that's that's the key to the success. I think it is the word community. We were truly, a, or tried to be truly a community institution, mm -hmm. and they were looking at the business. So the 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 real leaders, well, I should say the real leaders. Some of the prominent leaders were the business people, mm -hmm. not not the education. Uh, pub the public school people had a real concern. They were supportive, and yet uh, they were concerned, but at the state level, local level, also about the funding. Mm -hmm. Here's here's somebody else. Uh, they were going to have to share tax money with, or they was going to require more tax money. So uh, there was concern on, on the part of other segments of the community about how how we were going to be funded, uh, how much we were going to need, and county commissioners themselves were, uh, while they, they had authorized the bond issue and, and support, uh, again, they were concerned, uh, mm -hmm. have you come here to spend all our money? <laughs> and uh, so we had to overcome that, and uh, the way you overcome it was by giving them services, training students that they needed. But the business community, very supportive. You couldn't, and they, uh, I found I had lived in other places here in North Carolina, and I, I don't think I had lived anywhere where the various segments of the community 
cooperated any more than uh, they did here, which means meant that you you didn't have opposition from some group out here. Certainly, you talked about county commissioners. You just had you just had to work on that reluctance that they had. You just how did you do that? Just talking with them. Yeah, you presented a, of course a budget to them, but uh, you learned to know them. They were business people too, uh, and uh, they, of course, at the office in the courthouse, they, they had a chance to observe everybody that came and went mm -hmm. in, in and out of my office, and occasionally I re would receive advice on who to employ and so forth, but I, I generally ignored that. I tried to get the people best qualified for the job. Sure. And when we located on, in the next to new building in back of the courthouse, we weren't far from the courthouse. So the commissioners had a good, a good chance to observe everything they were doing. They could keep a good eye on you. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> you and Mrs. Killian established an endowment fund, I guess back in the 80s, through our foundation to recognize good teachers. The Dr. and Mrs. William D. Killian Outstanding Teacher Award. Why was that important to you? Well, the teachers are the key to the success of, a, of an institution. Uh, if you don't have good teachers, competent, devoted teachers, you can't have a good school. I've said it many times, a lot of people administrative jobs, even mine, you, you learn to handle things like that. You can push paper across a desk, mm -hmm. but it takes a special, very special person to be a good teacher. Mm -hmm. And that's what students come to school for, is to go to class and learn. And so without teach so that, that was my first priority as far as if we were able to give anything, it would be towards the teaching. And uh, in North Carolina, there I believe it was First Union that started the yes. Outstanding Teacher Award. Yes. So, and I, at least it was when I was here, the teachers, I think, select that. Yes, don't you think that's important that they're chosen by their peers? Yeah, they're chosen by the teachers and then Whoever was chosen for that received our endowment award. Yes. It's really the, the highlight of the year to, re, to see who, who received that, receives that prestigious award. And the holidays are always a great time to show appreciation to faculty and staff for the work they've done. Tell us about the first holiday party. <laughs> uh, Dr. Parker Hill reminds me of that every now and then. I've told it enough to I've sort of worn it out. But tell I, us one more time. <laughs> but I'll tell it again. Uh, our first Christmas party was at Christmas in um, 1970. We had, I think, 15 employees. And uh, we were located there on Church Street. And so we, got, we had the idea we'd have a turkey. And, Ever, and the employees would bring the other food and all, but we bought the turkey. We had it uh, uh, cooked at McFarland Bakery, which is on Main Street. They, we knew they could do a good job, so we ate the turkey. And at, uh, later on, well, the auditor, the state auditor was with us at that time at Christmas. As a matter of fact, we uh, invited him in. He ate. He ate turkey with it. But when they did the audit a little later on, he uh, found out that we had purchased that turkey with state funds. <laughs> I was a little naive. I knew there were discretionary funds, but it was one of the things I hadn't got around to doing was setting up a discretionary fund. And so uh, he wrote us up for that, written up for the uh, wrongly buying the turkey with state funds and uh, 
The ironic thing was that he helped us eat today. <laughs> he helped you eat it. I don't think we've ever bought another turkey with state funds. You, no. helped, us, you helped us learn that lesson. No, I quickly or soon after that set up a discretionary fund, and all the schools had mm -hmm. fun. You had to have those. To, you had guests or someone you wanted to take to dinner that had an interest in the school. It was, it wasn't anything wrong with it, and he explained it to me. It's just something that I, I hadn't got around to doing. Blue Ridge Community College has, it's really unique that we've only had three presidents in 43 years. We, we've looked at that a little bit over the state, and that's really kind of unique. Um, what do you think makes a good president? Well, <laughs> That's a tough question. Uh, I, first of all, uh, I think uh, a good president has, has his own interests or her own interests in mind, but has the interests of other people in mind first. Students, your faculty, uh, the community. If you do the things that uh, the community likes or thinks, approves of, uh, and I don't mean you get out and just try and cater to them and do nothing else, but I guess you fulfill the goals of the school. And in doing that, if, if the community approves of it, then generally you're thought of as a, a good president. Uh, Again, the, the place to live had something to do with it. I didn't want to live anywhere else. <laughs> and uh, I don't think Dr. Sink or, or Dr. Park Hill either, uh, I mean, they, they liked living here. So that's, that's a part of it. But seeing that the uh, institution uh, follows its mission and does what it's supposed to, and then the employment of uh, competent individuals. Mm -hmm. uh, every, most administrators will tell you the secret to uh, being a good administrator is to hire competent people and then let them do the job. Don't try and do the job for them. Right. And that's easier said than done. You, you've got to hire competent people. And um, some some presidents uh, try and do the job all do, <laughs> do other people's jobs for them and that's that's not good administration. But do, that usually doesn't work out very well. No. Uh, so maybe we've been fortunate in that respect of of having uh, leaders who hired competent people and let them do their job. Just a, just a few more questions, Dr. Killian. I, I found something in the, uh, the book that David Holcomb wrote that I want to read to you. Um, in, in 1972, you may or may not remember that the students dedicated their first yearbook to you. This is what they said. He is a quiet man, never overbearing, always ready to listen. He is a proud man, proud of his family, of his students, of his staff. He softly demands quality and gets it. He knows the difference between an open door and a revolving door, and his presence ensures all that the doors of Blue Ridge Tech will remain an open one. He has created an institution which strives to serve all and rejects no one. Well, that's uh, a very complimentary it is, isn't it? <laughs> statement, and I have read that, and uh, I uh, appreciate the fact that th that was put in there, but I have never envisioned myself as uh, being a charismatic leader out front, uh, and I guess by just by nature, I am maybe more on the quiet side. I had to really make myself into a, a person that could jump up and extemporaneously speak to people and 
speak to groups and so forth. Uh, that that came with a lot of effort. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Had to work part. on that a little bit, huh? And I, I just wasn't oriented towards being a, a real charismatic type person. But uh, I do what I believe, and I may be <laughs> termed as being a little stubborn. I, I do believe strongly in certain things and uh, and and stick by them. Uh, the Kilians <laughs> have been called stubborn, but it it's means a commitment to, yes. to what you believe. So, uh, yes, I remember that uh, in the uh, first annual. And, uh, I think maybe Pete Dana may have... It was may very have eloquent, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> ...had something to do with that. <clears throat> I guess, is there anything that you made notes about that you want to make sure uh, that we cover, Dr. Killian? I had a couple of comments. Okay. Um, and paying compliments, uh, I don't think we recognize what the first students did. Uh, they started the school in an old rented building and with a... Uh, new staff, a new president, and everything new, they had to have a certain amount of faith in that the effort was going to succeed. And uh, otherwise, they, now they were veterans, it was a chance to use the VA benefits. But uh, the, the first students, the very first ones, 105 or 110, whatever, they had to have a a certain amount of faith mm -hmm. in uh, in the effort, and as well as the first staff. Uh, do I want to teach in a school that's just starting and you're not sure what the future is going to be for it? Uh, they had to, ask, uh, you know, ask themselves those questions. So the first students, first staff, and. Uh, the other aspect of that is the do-it-yourself attitude. Uh, we wanted to have classes by September. Well, I had not and just employed a secretary in January of that year. So we had to assemble the staff and uh, the building that we were going to occupy had to be re remodeled inside. There just wasn't time to go through all the procedures that required. If you're going to spend tax made payers money, you better put it out for contract, do all these things. So I told the staff, I said, if we start in September, we're going to have to do a lot of this work ourselves. So we painted the interior of that thing. We laid the uh, carpet, the first carpet in there. Fred McLeod, our first extension director, he had somewhere in his past experience and laid carpet, so he directed the carpet effort. And uh, we hired uh, Ned Wells, who was a builder, built homes here in the area. And um, this was, uh, Prior to uh, July the 1st, you present budgets on the 1st of July. Well, when talking with the county commissioners, uh, said nobody presented us a budget last July. We don't have any money. <laughs> well, the business people, uh, the uh, John Gregory and uh, Mr. Milroy at General Electric and uh, the head of uh, Berkeley Mills uh, said, well, I to explain the situation to them. And I said, now, we can go to the state. We can, they've agreed to have a school here and ultimately they've got to furnish money for it. But, uh, so they, out of their discretionary fund, they gave us, uh, Fifteen hundred or two thousand dollars to pay the telephone bill and do the few little things we needed to do. 
And I told Ned, I said, uh, in, build, in doing all this work, I said, you may have to work a month or so here before we get you paid, get a budget approved. So that's what we did. Ned employed another person and they, they did a lot, well, again, on the faith that <laughs> we'd pay them. Of course, then the commissioners began to see it was a serious effort and I think they heard, began to hear from the people also, they're going to start a good school there and you better get behind it. Because I didn't have any trouble much with the commissioners from then on. Mm -hmm. But they, they were just being a little tough. You, you, nobody presented us a budget, that's what we were. Of course they had reserve funds that could have done, could have given us extra money anyway. but the, they didn't cease it, but at come July the 1st of 1970, they approved our budget request and have done, I think the first budget I presented to them was $14,000. Today that's, it's- So that's ironic, that's where Dr. Park Hill is this morning. <laughs> She's carrying it on. Yeah, well you, you and they're, they're, the effort was new to them and they, uh, conservative by nature. Uh, in talking with state personnel who travel around over the state, uh, uh, we had a fellow in charge of building who helped us with any building program, Vince Allen, and he said that if he had to pick one group who, throughout the North Carolina who made the best decisions, it would be county commissioners. And that's because they're close to the people. Mm -hmm. They're right you know, they were, people live next door to right. them. Right, right. And uh, so they've got to make good decisions or the people will change it. Come knocking. <laughs> yeah, or let them know they're not. So uh, I, 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 would, I would agree with Vince that commissioners, by and large, do make pretty good decisions because of their position. <clears throat> uh, other, uh, just sort of personal comment is that a lot of people work in education. If you count public school people, university people, and all millions work in education and have worked in education, but very few people get the opportunity that I had or we had start a school from scratch. I mean, really, from from nothing. So it was a very unique opportunity, both for me and for the staff, to start an effort from the lowest level. <laughs> and uh, so that, that was important to me. And the other thing on, on satisfaction, uh, graduations were, uh, real important and unique at, and are at, at Blue Ridge, but during my days, all our graduations were indoor. We sit on a stage and you could see the audience. First Baptist Church, uh, wherever we could find enough space. Uh, we didn't have any outdoor graduations, I don't think, while I was here. Well, it gave you an opportunity to see the people from up on the stage. And the happiest people I have ever seen in all my life are the people sitting in the audience at Blue Ridge's graduation. You see uh, husbands, wives, spouses, uh, children, grandparents, mm -hmm. many of them seeing somebody in their family graduate for the first time. And they were just as happy as, as that person that walked across the stage and got the diploma. And without a community style institution the way we were, uh, they wouldn't have mm -hmm. ever seen that. But to see uh, somebody in your family graduate, for the, for the, be the very first person to graduate from college is, is a, that's an important event. It is. And, uh, I think of my own situation. Uh, 
My dad had a third grade education. He lived on a farm and went to school a little bit, but largely self-educated. Uh, and here uh, I was able, to, he was able to send all his children to college and I earned a doctor's degree. So it, there's been some, <laughs> some big steps in, and that's what we were seeing, seeing right here was students graduating for the first time. <clears throat> so I, I, I would classify that as the, the happiest faces in the happiest time, and I think it still is. It's one of the reasons yes. I still come to graduation <laughs> is to see see the satisfaction on the faces of people. That would have to be some of your fondest memories, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other thing, it goes back to uh, the being the first president and the first staff. Uh, that is so important. I'm not trying to really uh, pin any uh, medals on myself, but whoever is the very first president, they're going to leave an imprint on that school, good or bad or indifferent or whatever. Uh, so it was a, a chance to leave some of your thinking and some of what you believe because that's going to live on. I, I, how you get started, how you get started is going to d determine to a large extent how the school is going to be. Now it'll change over years and it'll change with time, but the first president or the first administrative people have an awful lot to do to determine how, what kind of school you're going to have for years to come. Are you going to be vocationally oriented like I was? I, I believed in training people to work for job for real jobs. So, uh, to a lot of the community colleges, uh, the transfer program of uh, sending on to four-year institutions is probably more important. But when I looked at education in North Carolina. Uh, we have an extensive university system, 16 or more universities, uh, 54 community colleges, maybe. 58? 58. 58. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't think we need more. We need to make all of these that we already have better. Yes, sir. And not worry about establishing new that is as far as public education, you know, in the public sector. You know, private colleges will, or private schools will spring up, but uh, I think the priority should be let, let's, let's make real good institutions out of what we have and not, not try and expand or establish new institutions. Uh, a frequent question I would get is, uh, when, are, when are you going to become a four-year institution? I'd say never. <laughs> we already that. have four-year institutions and we have community colleges. Let's, let's do a good job with what we have as opposed to trying to change. <clears throat> the, uh, uh, just, well, prior to when I came here, uh, they had what to call contract farming. Mills River area, the uh, migrants came through regularly every year and they grew a lot of beans, cucumbers, tomatoes. Well, tomatoes are still fair, but uh, as the county developed and we got housing developed and so forth, uh, a lot of the ag land has been and it's really the reason I never continued teaching in vocational agriculture. The family farm disappeared. And what ag farming done now, by and large, is it's all a commercial, big commercial effort. And uh, the, ag, the old ag teacher was designed to, to work with the families and, and uh, encourage, because at one time they worried about 
knowledge of agriculture and did we have future farmers coming on? And uh, that that's a good point, David. The ag seen all over the country. Of course, with machinery and the, again computers and all, it's, it's a different operation. <clears throat> Certainly was a big attraction to industry locating here, and that was we had uh, we did training for uh, steel case. Uh, one of the factors that they and most states use this as a selling, particularly South Carolina, where the. So it attract, one of the benefits was the attraction of, of industry. And the other is just attraction to people that are, are, are going to relocate and live here. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, real estate people, a lot of them tell me that they get a prospect comes in, wants to buy a home or something, that, that Blue Ridge is included on their if they don't know the community, they make sure they come by here and show them. We, we have a college here. And uh, so that, that's the things that spring to mind. And then your, uh, this, the institution itself, uh, the payroll we mentioned, uh, that's, if you want to look at it in a business fashion, uh, the money spent there is a benefit to the community, but I think the biggest uh, benefit is the it it affects the nature of the of the community of the college. It moves you from being looked on as a backward place or a place that no someone doesn't know anything about to a community that has has a college has their own institution. So finally, how would you like to be remembered? Oh, well, the, the, as stated in the uh, first annual, uh, as a person who was concerned about the working guy, mm -hmm. the working people, helping them get jobs, and then in so doing, bettering their situation. This is the person that's uh, helped other people. Uh, learning, learning. Uh, I'm from a family of teachers. At one time, I have two brothers and a sister. At one time, all of us taught. And uh, I guess it's sort of, <laughs> in me to, to, to care about education and people who teach. BRCC-TV, The Education Channel.